<laughs> and there's our recording button, so we're all lit. All, all right. right. Well, we got the technology going, everyone. Good morning. We now have a legal quorum uh, of online members, and we have five in the room. And uh, we have another one in the room. All right. We have exceeded our quorum. Oh, I can go home. <laughs> <laughs> and now you just drove this whole way. <laughs> all right, Sam. Who are you today? Sam Shannon has entered the room, so he is now part of our quorum. And there's Leah. Leah's, Leah's on. Okay, good. All right, Leah, thank you. Okay. Um, our technology is now working. The meeting's being recorded on <coughs> Google Meet. Um, for those online, we can see you guys, and I think you can see us with the technology that the room has now been set up. Um, and uh, Jim is our camera guy, and so he can actually zoom in to somebody or zoom out. There he goes, zooming in. Um, what a guy. So when, when he's done with the district in February, he now has a new job. Uh, videographer for somebody. Yeah, it is. Yeah, February is his uh, done date. Uh, he, he will be a retiree. Um, can we put him on cork? <laughs> so... We will get our meeting started. Uh, we do have a quorum, as I mentioned, and we're going to start with our attendance. So uh, we'll start with the people in the room. Sam? Sam, Shannon, Cork. Let me, uh, let me introduce the next person. Um, he is uh, our newest Cork member. Uh, I kind of snagged him for Erica Winfield, uh, mechanical electrical engineer that I've used. Um, and I thought that would be a good addition for uh, Cork is to have mechanical electrical expertise because we get a lot of that work. And so, uh, Mike, go ahead and now introduce yourself. Uh, Michael Guida with MAG Engineering, MEP Engineer. Welcome Hello, everybody morning. online. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I think I met everyone else. He may not want to be my engineer after attending a couple of Cork meetings, but I'll, 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 fig I'll figure out if that happens or not. <laughs> See. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Holly Hahn, Office of the General Counsel. Uh, David Dolan, Deputy Chief Facilities Management. David Porter, Cork. And Lasseter, Cork. Lou Doctor, Cork. John Cheshire, Cork. I also have a mechanical engineering degree. Oh, <laughs> I knew it was an engineer. I didn't know it was mechanical. Jim Kennard, Facility Construction, Civil Engineer. <laughs> John. John Levinson, Rail Enterprises, representing as the Scovich Architects and Warden Smith. Jess from Cachio, Construction. Hey. All right, that's all of our people in the room. And so now we get to Virginia. Go ahead and announce yourself. Virginia Ferris, Cork. Tom? Tom Berger, Cork with a BA. <laughs> <laughs> Leah? You're muted, I think. So can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Well, we, we've got we've got you in attendance. We have you. We'll all learn sign language. Okay. Uh, I have nothing else to report on the chairman's report going down our agenda. Anyone with changes to the agenda for today? Nope. No one online with any changes either. So we are okay for the agenda. We, we have a new another, another attorney. attorney. Another. Frank Simon. Frank should sit over here where um, we have hearing assistance. Set up, Frank. Mr. Simon? Oh, over there. I'm here. <laughs> waiting for Frank to get set up. He has now arrived. I think that might be your audio enhancement stuff there, too, Frank. To the right. Your headphones? Yes. Yeah, the earphones. Okay. Um, anyone with a conflict of interest for anything we're looking at today? Seeing none in the room. Anyone online? Nope. I'm seeing head shaking, so no conflicts. Quirk report. Lou, you did a report for us last month? Yeah, we submitted it to Frank. Each of the board members gets a copy, and oh, yeah. there were no questions. Okay. You can do another one for us this month? Thank you very much. All right, we're down to staff updates. 
Uh, thank you. I'd like to start today. So thanks. Thank you again for everyone for, for coming to our meeting. We do have some new technology today, and I hope um, I'm, I'm here in the boat, so I hope I don't crash us into a rock. <laughs> um, a couple things to mention. The microphones in this room are very sensitive, and once the meeting is on, even your whispers are going to be heard by everyone. So please be mindful of what you say. And now you're on camera too, so please be mindful of what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, that. And um, for those of you in the room, scratch. keep your hands off the microphones, or I'm going to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> it turns off all the mics for everybody, so um, please don't touch them. Um, and uh, last thing I want to say was thank you for um, cooperating and coming a day early than we normally do. I know we have always given you a lot of data to look at in a short time. We do appreciate the effort you guys put into it, um, but we did have to meet on Wednesday um, this week. So, so we're, back, we're back to Thursdays. For we're we're going to be on Thursdays, yes, um, back to our normal 9 o'clock on Thursdays, the Thursday before the board meeting. Dave? Okay. Um, well, uh, I don't have too many things to say, but I have a, a couple of uh, quick points that people should know about. Um, so, as, as many of you are aware, um, we've had quite a number of changes recently um, at the district, not the least of which we have a superintendent, new superintendent. Um, one of the early, one of the changes that I've had is um, uh, Paul Needler has left um, AECOM. So, uh, we now have a brand new program director. She's on, online with us. Uh, Judy Yoder. Judy comes to us with a ton of experience, especially school experience, and has worked on programs like this before. So uh, we welcome her. We're going to kind of indoctrinate her into our, our uh, fast pace, um, sometimes high stress program. Um, but I know she's going to be an incredible success. She'll be great. Uh, great addition to our team. So we're looking forward to that. Oh, and I see that Mr. Michael Gelfand joining. Yep. So, Susan, we want to make sure we add Michael to that list as uh, well. Do, do you really mean throw Judy into the deep end without a life preserver? Well, that's we, the, don't, we don't want to say that online. Well, yeah, we wouldn't want to scare her away. Wouldn't want to say that in public. Far, yeah. yeah, before it gets too far in. <laughs> One of the other big changes. Um, many of you may uh, know that Miss Wanda Paul is our chief operating officer. Uh, she is leaving the district. Whoa. She's leaving the district uh, very shortly, and. Um, and uh, going on to uh, an incredible opportunity um, with uh, Houston ISD. So um, I, I personally want to um, thank her for all her mentorship with me. She's been um, an incredible um, leader. And one of the big things for me has, has been, she's been one of the big drivers of our program. My job to make sure that we, we keep steering it in the right direction. But she's been really pushing, keeping us um, moving. Um, what is I, ISD? Uh, school independent, independent School District. Sorry. Yep. My apologies. Houston, Houston ISD is uh, Houston School District. She will be the chief operating officer there. Oh. Um, and one of the things that I always take away from Wanda's <clears throat> time here is one of the things that we always stress. We are always focused on doing what is best for kids. One of our favorite phrases was actually sometimes early on in the program, we were flying the plane, we were building a plane while flying it, but now we've gotten a really good, strong base and we're doing a, a, a very good job in our program um, of which I'm very proud. But one of the, like I said, one of the important precepts that she's instilled on everyone in this program is always focusing on what's best for kids. We know we get bogged down in, in the business of construction of design and construction. And sometimes you can lose sight. And that's one of the main features that I hope that um, I'll, I'll continue to carry through forward um, as, we, uh, as we continue this program. And um, the other side of this is I wanna let everybody know that with Ms. Paul's absence, the great thing is that she left um, an entire set of operational departments in great stead, in great standing. They have excellent uh, department directors and a lot of really great people keeping this thing afloat. So as we always say, it's about the people. And in, and in this particular case, 
Juan Paul did a great job of leading us there. Um, but we're going to keep keep the boat going forward um, and uh, continue in that hard work that we do. And that's it for me. I suppose is there what's the district's process for searching for the next COO? Uh, they are in the process of doing so. I I, um, I know that there's an advertisement out there. I know that there's uh, certainly outreach um, for uh, strong candidates. And uh, like I said. We'll uh, we'll see how that all turns out. Um, the good news is we're moving forward. We got stuff to do. Mm -hmm. I always I always say, yeah, I, I keep my head down because I got a lot of stuff to do. Every time I pick my head up to see what's going on, I lose sight of the focus here. And our focus is getting this stuff done. Yep. Okay. Any questions for staff updates? No one in the room. Anyone online? Okay. We will move on. Um, public comments. Any public comments from two public members? I guess we take public comments online as well. well I don't think anybody's online there. This, uh, the online is only select. Oh, it is. Membership. So it's yeah. not just anybody control, in the public gets that access. Correct. We control that and allow whether it's staff uh, okay. or um, court members. So if you're a public member, you have to come to the meeting to have public comments. We have the listen only dial in option. They can dial in and hear everything that's being said. They can hear, but they can't, can't speak they and can't get their speak. three minutes on a topic. Sure. Is there a way to set it up that somebody can notify you in advance that they want their three minutes, even if they're online? Our, our public advertisement, our notice includes instructions on how to do that. Okay, so they would be allowed to do that. They can send it to me in advance. So they could get their three minutes virtually? Um, uh, no, it needs to be submitted in writing. Okay, so they wouldn't just submit to you in writing saying, I'd like to have three minutes in front of court doing it virtually and then be on the screen here for their three minutes. I'm allowed to collect their whatever they need to say and present it to you guys. Okay. That's fine. We, you know, in the 20 years I've been on court, I think we've had two people that spoke, <laughs> maybe three. <laughs> and in fact, I, 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 we welcome them to come here because yeah. we want them to yeah. stand in front of all of you and, yes. <laughs> and, and say their piece. Okay, the statue in Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's it for our public comments then. So we will now get down the consent agenda. Um, call the numbers and even if you're online, let me know, wave your hand, do something because we can see you. FC1. I still wanted that pulled. Virginia wants that pulled. FC2. FC3. FC4. I feel like a bingo announcer here. <laughs> PC1. You spelled it bingo funny. So there will be prizes then? <laughs> PC2. PC3, PC4, PC5, PC6, PC7, and PC8. Wow. Okay, we had one pulled, I pulled it, and Virginia pulled it, so I need a motion by somebody to accept the ones that were not pulled. Virginia is the first, Sam is the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone online opposed? Okay, that carries. So for the record, um, all in, in attendance and unanimous. virtually uh, unanimous. Right. Virginia, go ahead with uh, PC1, or FC1, sorry. Um, First, let me say that this may have been covered in comments. I've been having a problem receiving emails from Susan. I haven't received one since July, so I haven't seen any um, answers to the updates. But hopefully Susan will figure out if I inadvertently got dropped from her email list. So if this is a repeat, I apologize. But I noticed, I think it was on... Um, school 10 and 11 and i forget the name of the school oh God. i meant to print it out there's it's just a typo with the amount of uh oh she left the meeting okay she 
You may have hit the wrong button. She'll have no. to log in. Susan's revenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, while Virginia's coming back, yeah, one, two, I'll go through with my question. Mine was more of a general question that uh, one of the responses that we got back from staff about, uh, and it actually had to deal with the Delray full service um, and having to do uh, where the, the academic side wasn't fully determined by the time we actually got into design, and therefore we end up with extra costs because now we're doing something to address the academic side. Mm -hmm. So my question then relates to Roosevelt full service. And with Roosevelt, we've been hearing that it's still in process. It's still in process for determining the academics, although I think we've already hired the architect. No, no. Well, we've hired a, you'll, you'll see in a minute, but um, on Roosevelt full service, we've hired an architect and a civil engineer to help us with due diligence. We've already gotten all the academic programs from the adult ed and K-12 sides. So we know what programs are going in there. Um, one of the challenges we had on Delray Full Service, um, and it's, it's not really necessarily a fault other than the fact that um, we were told what the new programs were and what we found out late in the game was that they were also still going to be running regular old GED and ESOL and, you know, community type of things. That wasn't on our, on our list. And we realized after the fact, or as we were getting down the process, that those programs still needed to be provided at that, at that location, okay. leading us to um, do modulars. We had we have a different budget for modulars, so we were able yeah, to. My, my point was I just didn't want to have us run through the same scenario with Roosevelt, but yes. you're clarifying now and, that and the, ac the academic side has been resolved. Yes. We're not going to have somebody coming at us at the 11th hour saying, oh, by the way, let's add this when we're already in design. Yeah. We're, and and I will con confirm that we've had ex extensive discussions, and we continue to have discussions both with um, internal staff on the Roosevelt academic programs as well as the board member because – there's going to be a community component to that right. project as well. Right. And and certainly we the reason why we're hiring a consultant is we didn't want to go down the road and put that RP on the street and find out that we had a fatal flaw in the plan. Good. If we tell you we're going to do five academic programs in the RP and we can't do them, we're paying a designer for five programs and only doing three. And I know you all would say to us, what were you thinking? So yeah. we're doing the, the little bit of legwork ahead of time. We learned our lesson a little bit from Delray Full Service. Um, okay. And is that the continuing contract architect that's been is. hired for that? Okay. It is. All right, Virginia, we're back to you. And then Leah, I'll get to you. Virginia's muted there. Virginia, I, I apologize. I got disconnected somehow. Um, it, it was a, a repeat. It was a problem with the amount of money that was listed for one of the items, and when I try to call up on my computer to tell you, I get disconnected. So I will, I will um, send it by email to Jim after the meeting. Yes. It, it's it's uh, um, the amount of money listed in the first set of of uh, change orders is correct, but it, the amount listed in the the fuller description is not right. Okay. Well, Just we appreciate that. Back. Thank you. Does it matter? All right. We'll take care of that. Send that on to Jim. I will. Leah, you had your hand raised. Yes, yes. I just wanted to follow up with um, what Mr. Dolan's response was that the five academic programs as of late <laughs> have been uh, energy, aerospace, pre-architecture, technology, and finance. Um, uh, there may be some <clears throat> vocational a vocational uh, program in there, but those are the five academic programs. Yeah, yes, that's exactly right. For those of you who did hear those, um, and, and in fact, there are discussions on others as well. The problem I had with Delray Full Service is I found out yesterday that yes, they also would like to, at Roosevelt Show, do a, a, a have an opportunity for um, those uh, ESOL and GED type classes as well. I say that not to, to minimize them, but they're very simple in the from a programming standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's a classroom, right? It's just standard classroom, desks, chairs, audio, video, that kind of stuff. So that's really where um, where we're, we're fine tuning that to make sure we know exactly what's going to be in there. Okay, Liam, is that it? 
Oh, is it continuing to Jerry Seinfeld? Okay, excellent. Um, following up on Rouge Full Service, when do you think that will be going to RFP for architects? Well, right now, and you'll see it on my presentation in a few minutes, I do say October. Oh, good. That's, that's, um, that's optimistic. Optimistic. Might be November. It might be November. Fine. It might because right now the architect that we're hired, the architect and civil engineer that's helping us validate a lot of this, that we can actually fit it, make it all work. Mm -hmm. um, I would expect that I'm going to have a response from them within the next week or two. And with that, that will allow us to go to Mark Moon with purchasing and put the RFP out in October. But if it drags on, if we have challenges with that, that's why I don't want to promise. No, no, no. I'll put October now and say, yeah, best case, we'll advertise in October, but it might drag into November while we fine tune it. Close enough is just saying this yeah. year. Oh, absolutely. This, and it, this and, calendar year. And it's that's driving fine. forward. There's no question about it. Good. It's not a, eh, maybe we'll, no, it's, it's a focus on, we got to get it done and we got to get it done as, um, you know, best we can mm -hmm. that those academic <laughs> programs. Okay, uh, I need a motion to allow uh, FC1 to move forward. So moved. Virginia, motion. Ken seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Anyone opposed online? Okay, we are unanimously approved with FC1. Thank you, David. Leah, your hand raised. Uh, Leah, do you have something? Your hand is so raised on your uh, connection. I'm sorry, let me take that off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that completes our consent agenda. Wow. All right, I think our system is working by sending in questions to staff and then getting more complete answers that we might get at the meeting because all the staff people that have to respond are not here. <laughs> but, uh, we'll keep, keep that system up. All right, we are down to uh, discussions of in-progress FCA work. Hey, Jim, your PDF. Yeah, there you go. And if you want to forward for that one right there. Oh, that one right there. And if you want to then share it on the other screen. No, 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 no. Leave it right where it is. And just go. Oh, oh yeah, over here, right? Yeah, there you go. And then when you pick entire screen, pick the right one. There you go. That's going to be it. I keep on trying to figure out which one's different. Yeah. <laughs> So for everybody in the room, just so you can see, what we have is on the left-hand screen, we have the, the standard old Google Meet with the boxes and the shared view the, so that everybody at home should be able to see my Cork meeting construction updates on, on their screen. And for us on the in the room, the right-hand screen is our working documents so we can see uh, um, in a much bigger format. So, um, okay, I'm gonna get on with this presentation. Um, very much similar to every other month we've been doing. Um, Jim, if you want to go to the next one. Um, here's our standard. Jim, they're not going to be able to see it online because you have it it's shaded. That's uh, no, it, they can actually see it online. It's it just, okay. Yeah, they can see it perfectly online. It's more the way Google sets it up for us. So if you're the presenter, you don't get to see that. You're focusing on the actual document. Thanks for caring. Yep. <laughs> but hopefully everybody at home should have a clear white screen um, of this. Yep, so that Virginia's construction giving, funding. Yep. Um, is our is our to date actually I think it's the funding is through August our part our uh, participation is through July you can see there's always going to be a little bit of a, a lag on that on the participation because a lot of that is based on the reporting that great we have that great system um, diversity has that great system that's keeping track of all the, the uh, um, uh, participation and you can see we're, we're still keeping a pretty pretty good clip on the designers and and even the contractors at 28 percent of our uh projects are are uh going through diversity uh suppliers before you go on yeah um I'm, as you know i'm the cork rep on the sales tax oversight committee and uh leanne's on the line too but i'll just chime in with um the the sales tax proceeds that are coming in have even blown leanne away in terms of the percentage whoever thought the pandemic would cause there to be more spending than less spending in terms of sales tax. Yeah, Leanne, do you want to comment on that <laughs> before ahead, we let Michael? Um... Sure. The um, sales tax revenues are coming in really high. Um, when we looked at the data, the money received in August was earned in June. And when I compared that June data 
to 2020 and 2019, 2019 being before the pandemic, we're 20% higher than 2019 and 25% higher than 2020. So our current um, overall for the program, we're back to 115% above projection overall, but for the quarter ended June 30, and we were 125% above projections. So I did some digging and I think Mr. Porter, you wanted me to talk about that just a little bit. Um, I was looking at why it was up so much and it's um, everything is up from vehicles are up and I expect that's because there's a vehicle shortage. There's a the chip shortage that means they can't get the new cars up and running. And then you have tourism is up, um, construction costs are up, everything was up pretty dramatically. So it's, I don't know that it will continue that way. I would expect once the chip shortage and the supply chain issues get resolved, hopefully some of the prices come back down. But you know, since our meeting with ISOC, we also had a finance committee meeting. I had meetings every two Fridays in a row. And you know we are seeing inflation coming back and prices rising throughout the economy. So that's, you know, prices are rising, so sales tax is up. So we'll continue to monitor that and report it back to ISOC. And anytime you want me to make a comment on that, I'm happy to do so. Does this mean we're gonna have to cut off collection? No. It's really too early to say that. It's a good four years away before we have to make that decision. And just as we saw the last two years were very different than what we expected. Um, anything can happen. I will tell you if it continues and if revenues continue to come in at the same pace, we would have to shut it off a year early. But again, that's four years away and lots can happen between now and then. So I'm updating that data every month as day as information comes in. I've got it set to where it all works together. And every month I'm updating information and sharing it with the superintendent. Um, and we'll continue to do that. I send it and share it with the with the, with the facilities team so they can update this document. So we, we are monitoring it monthly, and we'll see what the next what happens in the next four years. Michael, Michael Gelfand, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Well, a few questions, and thank you for that report. It's very good. Uh, first is how is the list doing of the projects that were planned to be undertaken with these funds? Are we still on course of completing all of those or is that list going to have to be revised? No, it's on course. And that's what ISOC is doing is looking at things to see if there's modifications. The only modifications so far that we've come up with is really scheduling or shifting some funds you know, earlier than later. Uh, but so far, no cancellations and moving forward. Correctly, Ann? Yes, actually, there, there have been two or three cancellations. We did not d do the demolition of, of Gove Elementary, for example, because we gave the land to the city of Bell Glade. And we did not do the work at Gold Coast because we decided to tear it down and build adult ed. And the money associated with Gold Coast was transferred to Riviera Beach Prep. So we've had some things like that, and each one of those has gone to the over sales tax oversight committee to be reviewed. But what you're thinking of is the, the primary projects, that referendum list, it's still all intact, and we monitor that at every meeting. Those materials are available online, just like Cork has all the documents loaded on board docs, ISOC does as well. So you can look at them there, and there's also a website for sales tax oversight committee with every change and every report, they're all available online. Um, if that's something you're interested in, I can send the, the link and they can forward that out to you. All the meetings have been videotaped and recorded, so they're all accessible, just like this Cork meeting will be. And uh, Michael, you. if I may uh, expand on that, um, our program has a certain cadence. We've got a, a planned um, expectation of doing a certain number of projects each year, and there is a very defined list that we have internally to maintain, and we are maintaining that list. Um, many of you know because, well, how many RFPs do we put out and ask you guys to sit on the selection committees? We are nonstop. There's always, when we finish a set of RFPs, um, selection committees, we're on to the next grouping. So we are trying to keep that cadence going, and we are still on pace to maintain and done with all of the program at the end of the tenure. Thank you. Uh, sec second question is the charter school payout. Uh, where are those funds going to be coming from? Not us. 
Th oh. Those monies were set aside in the budget. Um, we we had we knew we had a feeling that was coming. We were hoping that the Supreme Court would hear the case and rule differently, and they declined to do so. So when the budget was built this year, it was set up, and we had a reserve specifically for that. And the first payment um, is supposed to be going out this week, um, probably today for effective on Friday. That would be for July and August, July, August, and September, actually. Are those ISOC funds, though? No, no, that's out of the operating budget. It, it is the it is the money, the referendum proceeds, not the sales tax referendum, but the operating millage referendum. Um, part of those dollars were were budgeted to go to charters, and we reduce the funding um, for the other schools. I mean, the, one of the good things that happened is property taxes in Palm Beach County rose by 5.8%, and we were expecting a 2% increase. So we did have some extra money in property tax revenues, specifically the referendum, and that made it a little less painful to, to share the money with charter schools this year. But it does not, sales tax is completely separate and apart, and they, they can't mix. It's like oil and water. It's a capital fund versus the operating budget. They don't mix. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. You're welcome. Virginia. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that since our revenue is going up because of cost increases, that our expenses are also going up. Are we matching that? Um, or are we under the um, increase? In well, other words, are our costs going up 25% or whatever it was that that the uh, revenue is going up? Yeah, th this is one of the, the, the points that I make with the Sales Tax Oversight Committee. Just because the money is coming in faster doesn't mean we have, we have more money to spend. We're advancing it. But when we build the budget, I keep the total sales tax revenue for the program constant as what was originally expected. Because just because it's coming in faster now doesn't mean it's going to come in faster through the rest of the program. So while we're at 115% of projections, the revenue is coming in faster, but the total amount of revenue has not changed. We've kept that constant. When we get to the end of the program and we know there is really extra money left over, then we're going to turn that loose to be able to spend. The same thing with interest earnings. We've earned about $9 million of interest We've spent about 300000 on fees associated with a line of credit to expedite funding so that the construction program can go as fast as possible. That money is set aside in case we need to do some other kind of borrowing. So the construction department is limited to the original budget, the original amount of money. Any excess money will be available at the end of the program. We know it's real and we know there's not a shortfall. I mean, just as we saw with the pandemic um, last March, April, May, and June, collections dropped to 60% of projections. And we recovered very quickly, but there was no guarantee that's going to happen. So I, I tell everybody they're stuck with the original budget until we get to the end of the program, and then we'll reevaluate if we're gonna, when we turn that money loose. And that'll happen with the, um, with the agreement from ISOC. So until then, when I build the capital plan, we had more money come in the last two years, and I'm just showing there's less money coming in the last year. So I keep that budget constant. So our costs have not risen the same way that the income has risen. We we have seen costs rise, project budgets rise. Um, so far, um, those have fit within. There is a sales tax reserve, and we've dipped into that a little bit. We've also had some projects come in under budget, so we've had it come in both ways. Right now. It's pretty neutral. We most of the sales tax reserve is still in place. Thank so, you. But there's about fifty one there was fifty one million dollars set aside to deal with unforeseen issues. So, Thank you. You're welcome. And she won't let me touch that fifty one million. <laughs> Not without ISOC's approval. And we try to set it aside because you know it's for a rainy day. You never know what's gonna happen. That's correct. And you were foreseen. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Leanne. Okay. You're welcome. Michael, your hand is so raised. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, um, continue on on this yeah. real quick. I'm sorry, yeah. I'll, I'll zip through this. You, uh, everybody knows that this is online. It's on board docs, so the general public can get it. You all can get it. Um, this, these are our upcoming solicitations. It's the same general list. We just updated as the things um, go through. You can actually see all of those have already been RFP'd meaning they're out on the street and gone through selections in several of them. Next next page, 
are the ones that are upcoming. And you'll notice right there, as, as we mentioned earlier, Roosevelt Full Service does say the RFP is in October. I left it in October uh, optimistically. I even yeah, okay. pondered it last night and said, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it, it falls, falls uh, coming forward. We're also working with our transportation facility projects. We're working with a consultant on that, the same premise, but without an academic component. It's more of how is everything going to operate interchanged, you know, interchangeably? Um, how does south transportation affect um, west transportation or central or north? Um, so we're working with a consultant on that to make sure we've got all of those programs lined up before we move forward with those RFPs. So we went and got a consultant to do an overall master plan for the county? That's And, and that's exactly what we're referring to that on transportation as well. I congratulate you. Yes. The question I've got on that, I mean, it's a really good idea to have the consultant, but if we look at when was the last time we touched transportation facilities over 20 years ago, at least. Yes. So in 20 years from now, we could have all electric buses. Yeah. Correct. So is the master plan thinking forward to the point for how do we bring in enough electric power and charging stations for an entire bus fleet and almost abandon gasoline or diesel? We will certainly do so because, um, and I think Holly and I can talk touch base on it pr prematurely, but um, we are working with FPNL right now and they will, there will be electric uh, stations, uh, bus charging stations at some of these transportation facilities because we are, I think we're anticipating getting um, electric buses, I think. Right. Le Leanne electric. had said we were gonna get some and soon, but what we probably need to do in the master plan is at least have enough service coming into the property. Yes. And then have conduit put in, or at least be able to extend that conduit. I'll put a big old trunk line in there. Without and, tearing up the whole then, parking lot, and exactly. then just having charging stations at each bus parking spot. And that, that'll be part of the actual design. That won't be part of our master planning. That'll actually right. be when we hire our designers to incorporate that component into okay. it. You're right. We're, we're going to put a big old trunk line, concrete in case, so that it's a plan for the future kind of thing. Okay. Michael. Will the consultants be um, coordinating or consulting with FPNL on power consumption of those vehicles and charging stations? Yes. Yes. And as a matter of fact, I think um, with, with uh, our general counsel's office, um, we are in the process of working out details with them right now on uh, what what we will need on that first phase, um, and I guess a plan for the future too. Yeah, yeah our office has been working um, directly with transportation um, to work with FPNL so that they can get an assessment of all of the type of equipment and modifications that would be required for the transportation facilities and then a second agreement with FPNL to come in and do those things because the program that FPNL has right now is that they would provide the charging stations free of cost to the district and then after a period of time the equipment then would would come back to or come to the district and we would own it but we're still in the exploratory phases with FPNL to hammer out the details and Michael, I think you and I are probably on the same page. Like, that's great. I just need to know what do I need to put in? How many amps? You know, what kind of storage capacity is there going to be? A, um, a solar component to this, and all of those those things. Those are the things that I'm worried about. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is that you know, keep up keep up the demand uh, uh, for 2020 2030 mm -hmm. coming up. So well, that was going to be our production. Too, whether we put solar. <laughs> on top of our flat roofs that we might be building for any new buildings to self power yeah. some you know build in batteries right now we don't we don't um, implement solar We're, we are not implementing solar because um, some of the programs that FPNL had offered I believe they may have sunsetted um, and uh, where there might have been a financial advantage mm -hmm. to go that route um, uh, at this point we're not exploring that plus from my own personal experience, when, when we put them on the roofs and then we have to do a lot of roof work, it's, it's <laughs> challenging. I, I know of a company that does floating solar. So if you have a body of water, hmm. you put uh, solar panels on the on the water and it, it, and you produce your power that way. That's even better if civil engineer can be involved in that. So if you have any properties with bodies of water, 
to produce solar there. And if you have to clean it, you just get on the boat and take the water out of the thing. Sure. And clean the, the uh, certainly easy maintenance. That sounds like a great alternative. Um, um, Miami, Miami uh, has done it, and uh, Orlando and Tampa, those uh, cities have done it. Well, like I said, at this point we're not, but certainly if, if the if the future um, if that's where we go in the future, we'll certainly um, look into that as an alternative because I'm not a big fan of the roof component. So. Well, I know, but something you might be able to work out with FPL as well is to basically create a covered parking lot. With cover it with solar panels and the buses park underneath it. Yeah, they they want to usually recover that. I know. So you put it back into the grid when we're not using it because the buses are out on their route during the day, so that power goes back into the grid. John, that may be crazy, but I seem to recall school districts were prohibited from putting solar on roofs. Ever heard that? No, we've had that before. Pine Jog was our first green building that we did. It's on the roof. And at Pine Jog, we have some, I believe, on the bus loop roofs. And that was kind of our experimental. I, I read that somewhere, but maybe yeah. not. Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't know, John. I would think. They will be right. I, I will look into that. Wow. Well, covered walkway canopy. Are okay. Now, those are okay, but yeah. not the roof of the building for some reason. I'm going. Like I said, I can see why I ended up having to pay a fortune for a silly little leak on a, on a solar panel in my house. On that's that's another topic. Okay. But okay, moving on. <laughs> um, as you can see, there's a number of the uh, RFPs that are coming up, uh, or sorry, the GMPs that are coming up. Delray Full Service, you saw now, and um, Eagles Landing, more common in Orchard View, um, are the next ones coming up very shortly. I want to say two months from now, but. Basically, very uh, within the next couple of months. Next slide. Um, Mr. Hugo has arrived. Oh, welcome, sir. Okay, um, I'm not going to read all these things, um, but as you'll note um, on the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet down, it talks about what we talked about before with Roosevelt Full Service. Um, we're a feasibility study for Roosevelt for scope definition before those design services procurement goes forward. Um, and we're, we're in the process on that. We've met out in the field with them. They're already working on it. So uh, design activities, um, you can see we're, we're writing in smaller text now because we have a <laughs> lot of projects that are in design. I got two different groupings of projects, ones that are finishing up design and about to go to GMP shortly, and then a whole nother group that are kind of just in the early stages of design. So it's a nonstop process. Our uh, um, our team is, uh, you know, well, they're Busy. spending Busy. crazy amount of time on that. So um, next slide. Again, and I, forgive me, I'm going to uh, fl fly on through these. These are our facility renewal um, updates. These are basically the updates straight from the project managers from the SPAs. Next. I think we got three of these. See a couple of the big ones is Wellington and Spanish River at the end. And some of our photos. Um, I always want to kind of put, put it on the record. I want you guys to see this because you don't get to see too many of these in place, but um, some of the work, some of it's not pretty. It's And that I often tell in presentations to people, I'm like, the things we do aren't always pretty but they mean a lot to us and to the administration, like the people that are running the school, because if the roofs aren't fixed, the rest of life is horrible, right? If the bathrooms don't work or they're not upgraded, we're gonna have problems. Life safety right there, evacuation plans. Exhaust fans. Okay. Modernizations. The next two are ones that we, uh, I think we're going to take them off the list right now. This will be the last presentation on Addison Meisner because we are now open, substantially complete, punch list. Next one is Washington. Washington's also open. Um, those were great openings. Very happy with those schools. And our new schools. All right. So, Triple O. It's early in the early in the process. You can see a lot of the activities that are gone on. Footings are uh, installed. Um, a lot of the clearing, underground utilities. 
ahead. Now, these aren't the impressive pictures. Hopefully, we'll months to come. So go ahead and slide next slides. Big pile of dirt. Big pile of dirt. You can, you can see that there's four forms in there. Um, I think there's another. Where's that located? This is on um, uh, on Lions Road in Lake Worth. Um, right north of that other school. Of um, Woodlands Lions. Middle School. There's uh, right on. In Montana? Or? Uh, um, it's kind of Western Lake Worth. It's, it's out on the western edge of uh, the community. No, the Lantown Road. Mike, it's a first brand new high school, not a replacement high school that we've had probably okay. in 15 years. Yeah. Next one, our new elementary school. Boca Elementary uh, School is, uh, we call it O5C. Um, you'll see that um, slab on grade. Yeah. Smaller school, um, the difference between Triple O and, and this school is um, Triple O High School is uh, not opening up this coming fall, this next fall. Um, but this elementary school in Boca is. So they are moving, they're moving fast. This is uh, Moss Construction. Triple Construction is working on the Triple O High School and this is Moss Construction working on O5C. Got a lot of work going on there. Well, most of the School of the Arts, um, I will probably do one last presentation for you. I'm going to do some more interior photos because um, we are now substantially complete. When I last spoke to you last month, we hadn't gotten the uh, auditorium or the performance spaces complete, but the school was able to open up all the classrooms for that sixth grade. Now the whole school is done, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, promise next month we will do some great interior photos to let you see what it all looks like uh, and then we'll pull that off the list um citrus cove core expansion this is one that you really haven't seen you've you've seen that we have an uh we have a project that's been underway but i don't think we've really been showing you a lot of photos uh basically this is a, a blow out the wall the out exterior wall on the cafeteria make it wider new roof extend the roof uh, bigger space because it's the kind of place where the school when it was designed was designed for a certain number of students but classroom um, size reduction changed that now we have a lot more students in there and we never got made the core spaces bigger cafeteria media center we did the media center previously but the cafeteria like the clinic things like that these these are uh, improvements on this project but the big one at Citrus Cove right now is this cafeteria expansion. You can kind of see there on the bottom left photo. Yeah, I think for the next time, if you could bring us a site plan showing how the addition got put on. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd love to get uh, Joel Campbell's RSPA on this. I'd love to have him present to you Fine. so y'all, he knows all the, the bells and whistles of what's going on in this. And this is a project um, with Hatcher Construction mm. and they've done a really nice job. They, like everybody else, has suffered the uh, industry challenge of material shortages. But we got everything um, up and running, and uh, the school is, is operating now. With a, we have a side cafeteria so that they can operate. Um, but that should be done, uh, completed by the end of the year. You said material shortages. Several months ago, you talked about labor shortages or getting subs. How's that going? Same. Same. But still tough. Yeah. Still a problem. Okay. Yeah. A lot of the contractors that are sitting in the room with us will will say they're here yeah, recruiting. Yeah, they're, they're, they're looking for people, but but they're also they they're, the good news is a lot of the contractors we work with have a really strong control of the industry. They know who the vendors are. They work with the AGC regularly to make sure that they're reaching out to get, you know, hit all the opportunities to find new vendors, new uh, subcontractors. To help them along the way so that's one of the advantages of having some of the bigger folks that, that participate in our projects is they know the industry they know the the uh, the way to get, get uh, good subs and they also do a strong job and i'm not blowing sunshine for these guys but they do a strong job of overseeing them and making sure that they stay on task you know they know it's their reputation so yeah. getting the subs in is a is a a big challenge for them i'm certain does uh Moss see any problem of hitting that one year scheduled date because of our lead time issues with labor and materials? 
Um, they, haven't, they haven't mentioned anything, I guess. They have not. And I, <laughs> I, I've, I've talked to Matt Mahoney um, not too long ago, and um, and Angel um, Angel Garcia is the SPA both on O5C and Triple O High School, and he's indicated that they're not telling us that right now. Um, but you're right. <laughs> it is this is the time? Um, if they're, they're, I'm certain that Moss is on track to make sure that uh, all materials are purchased ahead of time, um, especially with those long lead items. Mm -hmm. So, well, if they've got enough concrete to get the slab done, then that's that's helpful because there's even been delays on concrete. Yeah. Lou. Yeah, I had a question. It's not an objection, just an information question. There were two items here where Gulf got awarded to the same uh, contractor, and one's a middle school and one is an elementary school. Now, I was wondering, it was PC7 and PC8 on the agenda. Why did we combine them both to two completely different schools at the same time to the same contract? Uh, dollar value. We're, we're, um, we all along, and I don't want to get into how the sausage is made, but all along we've packaged RFPs. Um, the facility renewal projects. We've packaged them based on location, um, based on size, and um, you know the types of scope. And in this particular case, we were trying to make sure that there were bigger projects and then some of the smaller projects. So we might have an RP out for a $3 million facility renewal. One, just one school. That's the only one and it's being awarded to an architect and a contractor. But at the same time, we might have that another RFP with a $3 million school and a $5 million school. I wanted to make that an $8 million project. So we, we're kind of distributing it so that we get different types of contractors. I don't always want to get the same guys in this room getting every project. I want to make sure that we're distributing the work around. And that means making sure that we have uh, opportunities for all different types of companies, smaller business companies. That's why we're, we've been really focusing a lot of our, our efforts at um, giving those opportunities. Um, but we're we're trying to balance all that. We we don't want to put a project out, uh, an RFP out, where I've got a project up in the North County and the South County in the same RFP, because it just means that the contractor ends up having to have two totally sets, different sets of staff, and it's not a savings for me. We'll, we'll try to make those packages where we would anticipate that those contractors can have a duplication of services, same project manager, or maybe a same um, superintendent and have two assistant supers at the two different sites, something like that. Well, it, was, it was the same. I, I had the same question, but then I looked at the who was on the selection committee, and I saw that they were the exact same RFP. So they put two, they lumped two schools into the same RFP, which is why the same contractor got it. Two separate contracts, one off the fee. Yes. Okay, any other questions on follow-up? Not seeing any questions online, nothing in the room. All right, uh, you're down to errors and omissions. Thank you. Um, Where did this come from? Well, uh, actually, it came from you guys. Okay. Yeah. As we've been doing the delegated authority reviews now these last couple of years, you guys have been asking harder and harder questions and you're getting smarter and smarter about how construction management contracts work. And you've expressed this discomfort uh, with relation to buyout, the term buyout and unpurchased scope. And um, there seems to be ongoing confusion about that. But the basic function of, of buyout in some cases is that there's scope gap that's created um, when the GMP is are put into place. And that's an instance where the CM, whose job it is to frag, fragment the scope and get it purchased, misses a piece of it. It's on the plans, we intend to buy it, but they forgot to get someone to build it. So that scope gap is also a term we use for buyout. Um, but the, the root of the question is, um, is that an error? Is that an omission? Do we hold the CMs accountable for that as a guaranteed maximum price, right? Well, we decided that we would speak with the AGC. And Gary, you're here representing them today, I think. Gary? Well, we do. <laughs> uh, it was like Jerry, Jerry, yeah, we met with the AGC and Jerry was there, but I don't want, want to put you on the spot, but we, we do want to let you know. But. Right. So, um, thinking about this, Dave and I were brainstorming, and 
We have a policy 9.065 that is uh, errors and omissions of construction professionals. It doesn't say designers, it says construction professionals. The, the content of that policy does focus on designers. But we think we could probably, with relative ease, include CMs in that so that if we have a buyout that is actually an omission, a scope gap, as I just mentioned, we could call that an omission of the CM. <clears throat> and sometimes also the CMs can make a mistake. Um, and that way we could track them the same way we track for um, design professionals and thereby give them um, some exposure to the quality of work that they produce for us. And we can keep track of that like we do for designers. So we, we went to the AGC, and Dave, do you want to take it from here? No, it's okay. It's not intended to be punishment, it's intended to be open government. And um, they did respond positively to that. So um, throwing it on the table for you guys, do we want to start talking about policy 7.065 to include construction managers? I guess my thought is a couple. If we did a hard bid and somebody misses something in the scope, it's out of their pocket, their problem. Because it's a GMP, we're a team. And so if they miss something, I like the idea of putting it into a grading system. I mean, we still have to pay for it if it's an omission anyway. Just like even if an architect misses showing tile in the kitchen floor, we still need tile on the kitchen floor. So we still pay for it. Where if we have to pay extra because the tile wasn't done until you know the kitchen's ready to open, then we got to do all the work at night. Well, that's out of the architect's pocket at that point because it's extra work. It's not just missed items. So with the construction side, my thought is that we use it as a grading system for the PPE process. Okay. And we kind of set up a PPE process for contractors because a good contractor who doesn't have the skin gaps is going to get a high grade and they should get a high grade because that's who we want to keep using. And a contractor that comes in and they miss stuff job after job after job, like we've got a couple of engineers at this point that are doing that consistently. Um, that should be a downgrade to me for that CM because it should reflect on our consideration of continuing to hire that contractor who's not doing the best job for us. So that's my thought. John. Um, there were a couple items today on FC1 contingency where there were scope gap items and the CM was paid for those. And I had a question and it wasn't answered, so I'll just bring it up again. But I, I think one of them might have been um, restroom fixtures or something. I don't remember. But apparently the school had, let's say it had 10 restrooms and they missed one restroom. How do you know that? How do you know he missed it? That's my, that was my question. Well, um, I tried to explain. I'm sorry I didn't do a good job of that. But... You know, when we take bid, when the CM takes bids, they get a piece of paper or a document that says exactly what they're bidding on. Okay. And it's just like if you take a hard bid, they list their exclusions, um, exceptions, comments, and um, the CMs have to cope with that as well. You know, so I um, kind of lost my train of thought, but. Um, You're saying that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the CM, you know, has a piece of paper there and they call the sub in and say, well, why didn't you do that restroom? Yeah. Well, I told you when I. Bid it, it's not there. But when you bid it, you told me you were going to do all the restrooms. Well, it might have had an exclusion. See what I'm saying? The, the CM has the document that says what the money is going to pay for. So that's how we know. So what you're saying is that bid excluded that, it, there was an exclusion for that one restroom. For some reason, the guy says, I'm going to do all your restrooms, but not that one. Well, it could have been, John, John, if it was like there's 10 restrooms in the building and the guy gave a bid for nine. Nine. Right. By default, he basically excluded one, and the CM didn't pick up on that when he received the guy's bid. He, he, I haven't seen the paper. to do them all. You should have given me a bid to do them all. It's on you. Well, basically, it should have been right. whatever was on the plans is what you're building, and that's, that's really what the CM contract should say with the sub. And the problem there for, from us, from a public entity, is that we're, we're being unjustly enriched because what you're suggesting is that I turn to any of them, the prime or the sub, and say, I don't give a hoot that you missed it. Get me a tenth toilet. You, you didn't put it in there. I don't care. I'm only I'm paying thirty thousand dollars. Three thousand dollars a toilet. No, no, 
you know, that you need to get me that 11th toilet or whatever it is. Um, and I'm getting it for free. And we really, we kind of dance a fine line on that from a government perspective of having to be unjustly enriched because you're basically saying, we know you, we see the proof that you messed up on the contractor messed up on the bid. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's a dicey area for us to be in. Okay, if you see the proof, that's one thing. And, and I've run across this before um, on my, when I've done my jobs. And what I normally do is I allow the sub to, okay, I'll pay you for it, I'm not getting any profit. And I tell the CM the same thing. Okay, we're going to pay for it. Don't charge me any profit. I'll pay you what it costs. And that way nobody's unjustly uh, um, enriched. enriched. I agree. I agree. Sure. No, I did. did you have proof that you could have actually given the court showing that there was legitimately a missed bathroom with this example? That's managed at the project manager level. I, I, I don't ask for that myself, um, but they have to prove it. So. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I don't think we need that as long as you guys are reasonably sure it wasn't in there. I, I have confidence in the system. Leah, yes. Yes, yes. I, I don't know. Maybe I just don't understand anything, but I don't understand the unjustly enriched part. If there is an error and omission and something isn't delivered that was supposed to be delivered, then you're just we're just being made whole. We're not being unjustly enriched. So I, I don't quite understand that. Well, well, because the premise being somebody else is going to have to pay for it. If the guy said $3,000 a unit for nine units is $27,000, and we say to him, no, no, our plan said 10 units. We need you to get us 10 units. We'll pay you $27,000, but you can't get that 10th unit for, um, for $27,000. You need an extra three to pay for it. That's that's us being enriched. We're getting um, a discount. I don't see it that way. I just see it as someone's got to pay the price for the omission, and so I don't see it that way necessarily. That's my. I, 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 I understand it. As a matter of fact, um, many of the contractors that are sitting next to me probably don't like me for some of the times where I basically say the same thing. Of uh, yeah. You committed to me you were going to do it, now do it. I don't want to hear the, the sorrow, sorrow story about the poor sub or whatnot. They just have to do it. We do hold that line, but we're, we're, it's kind of dancing that line where, where we kind of, if it's a single toilet, it might not be that big of a deal. Contractor will make it up somewhere else. But some of the, sometimes the challenges are a lot bigger than that. Mr. Cheshire's point was, okay, we'll, we'll pay for no markups. If you missed it, we'll pay the hard cost only. That's it. I think that's fair. It is absolutely. Well, and I think we can set that up as a, a kind of an errors and omissions policy with the CMs at that point. So mm -hmm. it, it's known up front. And, you know. So what's going to happen? Because it's Mr. CM, we're paying you to build by drawings and specs. Here's the drawings. It had 10 bathrooms. You didn't catch it when your sub came in and said they were giving you a price for nine bathrooms. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at it now. One of them was for $1,500 and the other one was for, for $6,000. Personally, if I was the CM, I would eat it and not even bring it to the school district. I'd be embarrassed that my sub missed something like one toilet, one restroom with a toilet accessories. I mean, I'd work out the deal with the plumber and eat it myself, but I wouldn't even bring this to the owner. Yeah, no, the, the, the sub made it egg on the face for the CM. And the CM didn't pick it up either during the bid process. The good news is that this is being recorded. So hopefully the other contractors that we work with are seeing this same recording because we agree with you completely. So I guess I guess what you're asking us is, should we develop some type of a uh, errors and emissions policy that aligns itself kind of with what we've done for the architects and engineers? You guys express distress in some easy manners. And I think we need to address it. I think there's an easy way to do it if you guys are on board. And I like John's idea of no, uh, no you know, overhead and profit for something like that if it's caught and we're going to agree to pay for the extra work because it's work that we needed done anyway and was just missed. I really feel like the CMs will comply with that without any fuss. Yep. Lou. You know, I recognize we're talking about contingency items, perhaps not part of the original design. However, I had the exact same comments that my friend had. How do you miss 59 trusses when you're reworking a roof? How do you miss 160 metal tiles? Some of them because we didn't have the money to do it. So 
was it lowballed in order to get the contract and then they added the added scope but if it was one example i would ignore it but that type of situation happens on a number of these items now you can't put all the details on the pieces of paper we look for so that why the gaps bring up questions on there's something missing in the story and there's four or five of them that cover this whole uh, business without picking at the details so it, it, to me the buyout is just a cover-up rather than going into more details John. Yeah, one other point on this. Uh, if, a, if the plumber missed it, let's say he got the job because he was $1,000 low. Now he comes in and says, I need $1,500 because of this. The low bidder or the second low bidder should have got the job rather than low bidder. So you got to think about that as well. Maybe he did low bid it, like Luke says, and now he, now he wasn't low bidder anymore. Well, it's easy to bid a low bidder when you miss the toilet room. Well, and that should be, as, as Jim said, that's that's on the level of the SPA. They they know that they, they were at the bid openings. They may, they have the bid tabs, so they should be able to yeah. validate. Yeah, the other one was twelve thousand dollars higher. Hopefully, that, well, that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have made a difference, or maybe it would have. So, point well taken. So, is what we're asking staff? I think maybe like a twofold policy. One that if there are omissions, perhaps. A profit and overhead is not charged. And two, it sounds like we're asking to set up a PPE style grading system for contractors. And they, you know, they get a 4.0 if they bring job after job to us and they have missed anything. Or we don't know that they've missed anything because, like John said, they don't even tell us about a $6,000 goof. They just take care of it. So it would only be the things that come exposed to us that becomes something they might get graded down on. Well, to me, shining a light on it is always going to make things better. So yeah, you know, yeah. Let's put some John. When I saw this on the agenda, I actually thought this had to do with errors and emissions of design professionals. We've talked about this many times um, in the past that we're supposed to see the architects' closeouts and see what the errors and emissions are for the ENO policy and like I said before as long as I've been here I've never seen one you got yeah. plan on I have, I have it tabulated but you plan on coming back to Cork with the close out of the project so we can see what the ENO is on project it's really up to you guys I'll present it any way you want but every time every month Susan updates the list of closeouts for me and I compare the errors and emissions and if there's a, any kind of issue with it it goes back to the SPA but no one's gotten close to the threshold. I sure. can absolutely present that to you any any time. Right? I think what would be good is when you give us that final document that closes out and gives back GMP money. You know, sales tax money is coming back. Direct purchase money is coming back. We haven't used all the contingency. That one-page document, we have some here. When we close the job out, give us that you know, list that finalizes that project. Because by that time, you would have cleared everything up with the AE because the job is done and this is the final payment to the contractor. We, we can absolutely do that. You know, and, 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 and as you said, it'll be part of you our haven't story. gotten to the threshold, so that's actually a good thing for us to see yes. because we're meeting the policy, but then we know about it and we can report to the board. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. So I think that should just become a standard procedure to give us that document. Just to be clear, you already have the information presented to you. When we give you the closeout document, the contingency log and the change order log show the amounts of errors and emissions. Very simple math after that. But it's okay for us to do it for you. We'll do it, absolutely. That's a separate, simple document that you can give us. I was going to say, I don't want to include it in the actual closeout package that goes to the board. Well, that's an Certainly overview. with Cork, it could be an added page um, that we, we document. Okay. Or just tell us where the information is if you're already giving us information that has that. I, I, it's... It's there for you to do the math. I didn't do it for you. Right. But I can. We do a separate stand, stand along uh, in the packages. Yeah. All right. Does this happen often? What? I'm sorry? I'm, I'm missing toilet. Oh, with the oh, GMP? Sure. Yeah. 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 All the time? Just almost every month. We yeah. Quite, quite a bit. I mean, and it, it's, again, it's not a function of bad contractors. There's, it's kind of, you know, part of the, managing um, a million different moving parts. Okay. So our SPAs do everything they can to try to stay on top of that. 
it happens. It doesn't happen frequently, but it happens certainly, as, as you guys said, probably every month. We, uh, we probably bring something forward where they... Uh, well, Sam, it's the same as the architects and engineers. I mean, the engineer misses 15 whatevers on an air handler. I mean, the volume of drawings, 400 sheets of drawings to do a school, you're going to miss something. It, it just seems to me, because I rely on PPEs a lot, you know, when, and then if that happens, <laughs> that would be reflected. And th there was jeopardy mm -hmm. for missing that. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, where's the jeopardy here? Well, the contractors do are part of the PPE process. Yeah. So there is a score for them, but it's not unlike the way the designers right now, there's a PPE process for the designers, but they also suffer um, potentially suffer if they've exceeded a threshold of reasonably okay. uh, and reasonable and it's our staff understanding what is reasonable. Yeah, I want I, segueing onto that. I mean, I wanted to revisit the thought of PPEs for our major consulting engineers. Um, I know we don't select the engineers directly; the architects bring them with them, but. We've had a, a recent history, and I won't name the engineer, um, of lots and lots of errors and omissions, and I think that they're overextended, and yet they still keep being brought in by other architects that put them on there as their consultant. And not everybody on the selection committees had experience with that engineer and some of the errors that they've created and omissions. I don't know how we can separate a separate PPE. I mean, obviously, it reflects on the architect. And so if the architect's PPE goes down because of the consultant that they're hiring, that takes a long time for that PPE to slowly get dwindled down enough that it matters. But I would think even the architects picking their consultants would love to know what we think about yeah. major consultants. I would have no idea, you know, about that engineer. <laughs> Except well, that they're they're you know on everybody's selection <laughs> job after job after job, and that they know what the district wants. Well, I think we've kind of gone into this in the past. We've kind of touched on this in the past where I'm not saying we can't do it, but it's I mean it, now you're now you're expecting every sub consultant to be tracked in a PPE format. I'm sure the architects would love it because then they don't get blamed for the failures of their subs. But that's the point. If you're the lead, you need to make sure your guy's doing their job. You need to know a little bit about everybody else's work if you're going to be the lead, to be able to know that they're doing a good job. And I, you know, I think that's um, it's quite excessive, uh, a challenge for us because we do have quite a few. Um, I would just do it for, I would, only, I would only do it for MEPs and civil. They're the only two we've ever gotten change orders and omissions for structural. We've never heard about structural. Jim. Well, no, still too many. Well, maybe a compromise. When, when we do our summaries for you every month and we write the word omission down there, we could easily put in parenthesis, MEP, CE, electrical. I think we already know that. For instance, if there's a plumbing issue and it's an omission or an error, I know that's the MEP. <laughs> Step would be to name them. Well, I always ask that anyway. Who was this engineer? Mm -hmm. Dave, do you have an opinion? Well, where can we see the grading um, PPE for the... The, the PPEs are, they stand for uh, performance, uh, periodic. periodic performance evaluation. And we started that about 18 years ago. Yeah, but where do we find that? It wasn't in the documents. Yeah, a selection can... committee. You, you'll get emails as you get on the committee <laughs> asking if you can participate on a selection committee to pick an architect. Be. The architects all come with their own consultants listed. And at that point, you will get, as part of your package, it gets sent to you from purchasing all the PPEs for the architects that are proposing for that job. So if there's nine architects, you will get, if they've been with us long enough, you'll get nine PPEs. And some of those will be for like the last 20 jobs they've done, and some might only be for the last five jobs because that's all they've done. Okay. There will be a score, and it's on the zero to four basis that college is used for. So they might have a 365 PPE on 20 jobs. Well, that shows they've got a really strong record in terms of being responsive, in terms of quality of drawings, in terms of errors, omissions. Um, so 
the architects have to really stay on their game once they finish the job because they know if they want that next job and their grade goes down, they're not going to be considered. Right. And it does matter because you know that I know, we know that because on our side, when those PPEs come in and they're bad scores for having really messed up something, they take it personally. They, they know that it hurts them because it, they're trying to differentiate themselves from that next architect or that next mechanical engineer. And all you need is one little ding against you and you go, oh, that's too bad. So they really, they really, it is a, a very important point for them to stay, stay clean. And the people born with me and the selection committee. Sounds to me like a footnote on the PPE report should tie into this. Because I look at a PPE report, and, it's, and at one point, it's a two and a half, but you don't know why. And that could be an important thing. Jim. So we, we do encourage the project managers to write the reason for their scoring on the bottom. There's a comment section. They don't all do it. Um, I like to do it because then they know why I scored them that. And the other nuance to the PPE process is that it's unilateral. It's, they, we score them, they don't get the dicker. It's, it's what we say. And for Michael's benefit, those PPEs are done monthly. So as what Jim's referring to, I like that too. On a monthly basis, I'm going to write and say, yeah, the reason I gave you a 2.5 this month was because you messed up on such and such um, that cost us time or money or whatever. Next month, all clear, move on. Now you're doing much better work. So each month they're getting that evaluation, that, you know, that differentiation. And as Jim said, when it comes to, well, out of all the PPEs, you were 3.5 on all of them, but you had two of them that were 2.5. What happened? Well, we pull those two out and you see the details behind them. But I think the, the point here is the selection committee doesn't get to see those right. individual PPEs. We just see the- We just see the score. See the number. Right, we just see the bottom line score. <laughs> but you get to see each school and the different PP for each school, and then the bottom line average. Right. But we don't get to see the actual line items that you're talking about, Jim, that may actually have comments on them. I think that would be too much information, actually, yeah, when you're on selection committee. Massive quantities. And the graders are the SPAs, the senior project administrators, correct? Building department? No. No. Just the SPA. Just all SPA. The contractor doesn't chime in either. They, they are shared with what you give them, and they we ask them to sign it. So they don't have to sign it. Most of them sign it. So you yeah, acknowledge this happened and this is a good grade. No, I, I meant in terms of the SPA fills it out. And then does anybody else get to comment on that or just the SPA's, no, no, just no, the SPA's no, opinion? Well, the individual architects and CMs are free to call Dave. And that, a lot of times they do. <laughs> so, you know, they have, everyone has a boss, right? So. I mean, can I know it's extra work, but can we get the building department to chime in on these? I mean, they're the ones that see the quality or lack of, That's the, thing of I, the drawings. I want to say that that is um, their feedback to the SPA is what goes into the SPA's um, evaluation. If we're talking about like during the design process, the SPA's feedback is, yeah, I talked to, I talked to Shams over in the building department. He said, your plans stunk and they cost them extra time or whatever, you know, um, that is the kind of reason why he gets a two on his on his PPE okay. for that month. Right. So it, the good news is they're right next to us in, in this building, so there is quite a bit of um, reg, regular interaction. So we are. Are, are the SPAs kind of I'll say forced to go talk to somebody in the building department to ask about that particular architect when they're filling them out? No, I, but they're 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 concerned about the, how long. We, the things take if it's if it's taking too long or there's problems or you know they, the building department will come to the SPA and say All right. hey th they didn't bother detailing any of this stuff what, what were they thinking and not a guy knows so, yeah I'm thinking like plan review comments where you come back with a whole encyclopedia of plan review comments because the drawings were so lacking right. yeah I that. to me I <clears throat> the PPE to reflect that because again that's not the firm if it happens consistently that we want to continue giving out projects we have so many other firms, they might get two comments back from the building department because their plans are so fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I always worried that my building department was doing quality control, you know, and that wasn't their function, you know, is to implement the code. And, and so I, you know, asked them, you know, is this what's happening? You know, why is this? 
they are they are in fact doing quality control here. I mean, and it's not because they're required to. Well, I mean, they, it's they they just you know they like the rest of us. They'd rather see everybody come in with a nice clean set of plans. And if this guy stinks, we can either a grade him down and just say you stink, don't pick him next time, or we can say b, hey, learn from this, do it right the next time. So we do kind of. We do expect the building department to offer up some. Oh, certainly they. Sure they, get you know, they got to make sure the codes, you know, complied with and et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, if it's like you say, if it's this thick or this thick of the comments, yeah, you sort of got an idea. And you know the answer. Yeah. All right, so our PPE process just stays the same, and we'll just continue downgrading the architects when they're picking certain engineers that we know about. And I've been on selection committees, and I've gotten called out by some of the engineers because. I'll mention it the select and we just had two hundred thousand dollar change order cork because you're overextended and you can't get the job done right. He didn't like that comment. <laughs> yeah, so sad. Yeah. But hey, that's my job. We're here representing the taxpayer exactly. to get the best bang for the buck. You don't you don't hear me complaining because that's I mean, that's <laughs> I I appreciate the fact that, that there's another set of uh, sets of eyes. Are, are going through that process with us. So with the E and O and construction managers, I guess you're going to work up kind of a conceptual policy and get it back to us for conceptual. Then you can put it into a formal policy. Thinking I can use the existing 7.065 and just add paragraphs to it. Okay. Um, I'd like to try that first. Okay. Good. It's due in January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, selection process. This was a new and interesting document. Yes, um, uh, I'll, I'll kind of lead in on this. Um, selection process. It was, um, again, you, you wanna, want me to remind you how much I really do appreciate what Cork does. Um, John, John was kind enough to point out to us, um, or at least questioned, um, on our selection process um, and trying to find out why we don't include certain things. With that prompting, came to realize, John's right. I know I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> Man, I'm not supposed to say that too often. It's awesome, recorded. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. But in fact, um, the, there were criteria, um, CCNA criteria, that we needed to do a better job of being more specific and including um, scoring points for. Um, and these are the three topics that were, that were presented um, that we've deemed necessary to improve our selection process. As many of you know, the selection process is kind of a two-phase process. There's the facility renewal project where we only have a single phase. We'll call that the first phase. And then on larger projects, we have the second phase, the short listing and the final selection, right? The second phase is the final selection. All of these criteria that I have on here, the three criteria that we're talking about are all on the first phase. They get graded during the first phase. Right now, I, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's out of 100 points. No, um, 110. 160 points for CMs. Is it 160 for CMs? Um, and it's over 100 for design. I'm not sure what it is, but 120 or something. Okay. Yeah, by the time you get everything in, it's like usually 60 points for the firm and another 30 points for the staff or something. And then you got the SBE points, right? Well, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll welcome Mark Moon. If he's, Mark is on, he's welcome to weigh in on the total points. Um, but so we, 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 basically what we decided was we're going to um, increase the points. We're going to create a couple of more um, selection criteria points. Or, um, and the first one, of course, as you'll see, is location. And um, the requirement, CCNA requirement, is just to ensure that there is a differentiation of location. And in this particular case, we established it um, on a staff level of uh, Palm Beach Broward and Miami Dade. So if, as long as you have a business license, I think it's a business business location within those three, you'll get uh, the two additional points. Well, when I saw that, I was thinking, you know, why? I mean, is 
is it from our past experience of where we've gotten people? I mean, if they lived uh, in Jupiter, I mean, mm -hmm. they, there is a requirement to have a differentiation of location. But you can't just make it one process. town. You can't just make it one county. You could. I mean, that, that's my point. It should just be Palm Beach County. <clears throat> Other than that, they don't get the points. Uh, and that I, makes it clean. Because what happens in Martin County? I mean, Martin County touches Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. Leah, yes, go ahead. I like, I like the way it is with the uh, Tri-County area because that is the relevant marketplace for which we analyze um, who we're contracting with and as well as if we're looking to expand on a diversity of companies coming in, they won't have the opportunity to set up a local office if they're if you don't get the opportunity in the first place. So expanding it to the relevant marketplace, I think is, is appropriate. Well, I mean, what about Martin County? I mean, if we're gonna exclude it, I mean, that literally touches Palm Beach County and is 10 miles from the Jupiter to Cuesta schools. And yet you're saying, don't, well, you don't get the extra yeah. point. The reason being- I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I thought maybe that they selected that because that's probably where 80% of the procurement Dollars yeah, that's, spent, but that's easier, correct. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Because we don't, it wasn't, it wasn't blindly just because we want to do Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami Dade, but because we know the vendors that are registered with us, that are working with us, that are um, under contract with us, and as Miss Gaines says, they are in fact Miami Dade, Broward, Palm Beach. It's probably ninety-seven percent. So that's why we focus on those. John, well. The, the reason I think local is important, well, there's a couple of reasons, is that the district receives a significant portion of its revenue from Palm Beach County taxes. And it only makes sense to return that money as much as possible to businesses in Palm Beach County. I'll give you an example of, let's say, of a painter. If you hire a painter who's in Palm Beach County, he's paying local workers who pay property taxes, who buy things and pay sales tax in Palm Beach County. The painter buys his paint in Palm Beach County and pays sales tax in Palm Beach County. And one penny of that sales tax comes back to the district. So it just makes sense that local is Palm Beach County. If you hire somebody from Miami-Dade, that money is shipped off to Miami-Dade and you never see it again. Well, let, let me leave it this way. I, I, I'm going to um, recommend that we keep this and um, I will make it a point, actually I've already made it a point, of bringing it up to senior administration and to the board. Now I don't, this is not a topic for the board. The board has already made their intent known to us that they do want a participation for Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. They have made that known to us already. We will, Rep, uh, recommend that this be included. Um, as none of us sit on the board, we can we can voice that concern to the board or put forth your your question to the board. And if they so choose to um, act on it as such, will certainly change. But right now, there is no local preference intent by this board. Right and. Uh I got a few other comments about local. Your, your, the Broward County and Miami-Dade, I believe, penalize Palm Beach County consultants and contractors from working down there. They get a preference for local. Why shouldn't Palm Beach County have a preference for local? Um, another reason you got we like local vendors is, especially with the CM, he attracts local businesses and the proximity to the job site, you get better prices. You get better um, um, response to the job site when you need something. The guy's got to call an electrician up from Miami Day to change a fuse or whatever. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You want Palm Beach County vendors doing your work. Michael. I, I'd like to hear more about John's thing about Dave and Broward giving preference. I don't know any more than that, other than from when I worked. I thought there might have been something like that. Up, and there was definitely preferences. Now, I don't know if they still have it, but they did be. I think they did. I, I recall something along that. Leah, you have another comment? Uh, yes, I don't know if they still have um, preferences that would exclude, for example, it wouldn't just be Palm Beach County only, 
I don't necessarily have a problem with us at some point in time layering into the local point system, maybe three points for a company that is located in Palm Beach County. Because I understand the balancing of interest, particularly for, you know, tier two contractors that you want to, um, you know, make sure that those, the companies that are hiring those, you know, have some additional incentive. But um, I, I don't think that there's a local preference in Broward and, and Miami that excludes others because I know for many, many, many years, contractors were going down there because they couldn't do business here. So um, that's my input on that. I don't think exclude is the right word. It's a preference. When they do a selection, the uh, local firm in Broward gets more points than uh, yeah, that's what I was a saying. business outside. For example, the two points would go for a company that's in Broward or, or Miami-Dade, but three points will go for a company in Palm Beach County. Or one and two. Okay, well, we're talking about the points, the, the two points is ridiculous. I mean, that's you guys are just trying to technically comply with the statute. Uh, two points out of 161, 165 points, it should be 10% of the um, scoring, in my opinion, so it should be closer to 20 points. Okay. Well, I, I won't recommend that. I, I, I disagree, but I, I can appreciate the uh, con reconsideration of the points to actually increase um, slightly. But no, the, um, between the three categories, I'm not adding 30% more points on, onto the scoring process. Right. Well, again, these are not critical components. Remember, I want to stress that our, our selection process is based on two criteria. Please tell me if I'm wrong on this. The two major criteria are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the uh, experience of the firm um, and the experience of the, of the team. Right. You're correct with shortlisting. No, on the CN. Yes, uh, fine. that's where all, this po all these points are. It's also okay. a third category for cost and scheduling. For the, for the CN, really right. That's, that's, on the, that's on minor. The, yeah. That's on the final. Uh, Michael Gelfand first, and then Dickey. Thank you. Uh, well, I certainly understand the desire to have uh, some type of local preference. Before we go down the road of mutually assured destruction, I would suggest that if there are preferences in the other counties that would prejudice Palm Beach County contractors, that we communicate to the leadership of those counties and give them an opportunity, relatively short, to, shall I say, correct the situation before we, and I'll use the term retaliate and add our own. This should be a, a, a playing field that's a level for everyone in the area. Uh, and I would also agree that to the extent that Martin County's playing nice, they should be allowed because they are just as local as certainly Miami-Dade. Thank you. Well, and I think what we're saying too is that we're not excluding anybody. If somebody's getting two extra points because they live in one of these three counties, it, those points may have no impact on a really strong contractor located in Martin County to apply for a job. It's a two point difference. So, uh, Dickie Sykes, you had your hand raised. Um, I just wanted to make make the point that Aaliyah was absolutely correct. You know, it was based on the relevant marketplace. When we had our disparity study years ago, they determined for um, construction the relevant marketplace, according to Franklin Lee, our attorney who worked on it at the time, was Tri-County, Florida. It was South Florida. And may I also add, that the majority of our current contracts um, based on our B2G software and compliance reporting, the majority of all our contracts are being awarded to businesses in Palm Beach County. So them getting two or three extra points would really not make any difference because they're getting the majority of the contracts awarded. But, but Dickie, I guess I guess I'll debate that a little bit. Of all the selection committees I've been on for architects, uh, I would say that there's no more than 10% of those awards that have gone to Palm Beach County firms. 
Involved I'm looking at I'm looking at the totality of the 400 and some odd million dollars that have gone out. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the totality of the work. And the okay. majority of that work goes to Palm Beach um, County. And the reason why we have architects in Miami is because all the talent is not in Palm Beach County, especially diverse talent. So if you want to include exclude Broward and Miami, then you are going to be excluding diverse talent. And we don't have enough diverse talent in the architect and engineering field to begin with. So I can't possibly see why we wouldn't exclude counties that have that type of diverse talent. And I will say, and, and, and this not for, from a diversity standpoint, but from a top talent selection perspective, um, we can we can attest now three and a half years four years into the program that some of the broward and miami-dade consultants and contractors that we work with um are some of the best around we've really benefited from having quality companies and i'm not going to name names but there's there's one contractor who i'm thinking of who's a small contractor who's turned out to be one of our best and he happens to be from broward county but you know, we we don't want to penalize anybody necessarily um, for that. We do need to show. That's why I, I I'm trying to come up with a balance here, and I I need I need you guys to understand that if you want to debate the number of points, great, we'll come up with. It. I even like Leah's idea of you know a, a layered thing on the location maybe, but we have to include some differentiation on location but we don't want to penalize the board has made it clear we are not penalizing other counties and if the board so chooses to hear this discussion or as i discuss with uh senior officials and they discuss with the board members as well if they decide they want to entertain that that's fine but here and now we've been made we've been led to understand the board has not shown an interest in segregating and, and, and trying to um, exclude everybody else by giving us a boost up, Palm Beach County a boost up. Michael. What's the difference between a preference and otherwise? Two points. Yeah, but I, I'm saying, I, I understand the two points. Uh, where there's a saying that we don't want to prejudice others or discriminate against others by giving a preference. Isn't that doing the same thing? As opposed to the concept, the reverse concept of a penalty. Right. Yeah, there, there's no penalty involved. It's, it is if you're not. No, it's a preference. You, uh, somebody gets extra points, but that's not penalizing anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the diversity and the small businesses, there's already 15 points in there for a small business. So that's separate from the local and, and these other things that we're looking at. If I may jump to the local business uh, that's required, that's really not enough as well. I mean, I can go down and rent an office space and get me a local business tax receipt tomorrow if you put out an RFP, I'll go out and get it. I think the local business tax receipt should be a year old, just so that doesn't happen. And not only is the local business tax receipt required, but a substantial portion of the work that's going to be done has to be done in Palm Beach County. I'll give you an example. You can go down to, I think, the Tourist Street in West Palm Beach. A contractor can rent a suite he gets an address down there, he gets a phone number, and somebody answers the phone for him, and he's got nobody working there. I and you get a business tax receipt. John, I, I understand. Have the world on here. Excuse me? I understand where you're going. Okay. I sat in those offices with you, with a contractor who shall remain nameless, that we know rented a space in one of those buildings. I, I've been there through that. I understand that the premise. I just, uh, what I'm trying to do is, we're trying to comply. We have, uh, we are uh, understanding that there, the board's intent up until now, up until uh, without having been specifically asked, but in the past, making it clear 
they did not want to differentiate between Palm Beach County, Braid, uh, Broward, and Dade. Um, so we're comply. We're trying to set up a, a, a criteria so we can comply with CCNA, yet not have a big burden on this. Where because otherwise, then they're going to start having a uh, you know a board discussion, not a court, but a board discussion as to preference. And I'm not in, I'm not engaging in that at this time. I would love to see the board meeting where this was discussed and see what the board was told about the statute and why they made that decision. That would help me. If somebody can point me to the right board meeting, I'd like to see it. Because, I mean, you keep mentioning that and I keep asking for it. Let me see that direction, please. Understand, John. I, I'd, I'd love to tell you, and quite honestly, there's there's a lot more to this. What you're doing is you're scratching at the surface and it's leading to a much bigger uh, discussion because then we're going to start getting into disparity studies and all those other things. I don't that's not what this is about. This is about compliance with CCNA and giving uh, the companies that do most of the work with us uh, a, a couple extra points um, in compliance with that rule. Does CCNA it's not about trying to make somebody better than somebody else or knock somebody else down? It's not. This is about compliance with the CCNA rule. Does, I'm trying to make it effective. Does the CCNA require us to do this? It requires us to do, have a differentiation of location. That's it. Is that something new in CCNA or it's always been there? It's always been there. Hmm? Leah? Yeah, I just wanted to say regarding the business tax receipt, anybody actually really doing business in Palm Beach County is required to have a business tax receipt. So just because someone um, opens up an office here and gets a business tax receipt, that's, I don't understand. It, actually, everybody's supposed to have one. I thought that this should actually be looking at where their headquarters you know, is based. Um, and they should be able to show that with the business tax receipt from where their headquarters is based. Um, so, the, but anybody doing business in Palm Beach County, if, if the company is doing business in another county, they're required to have a business tax receipt there as well. Yeah, but I think what John was saying is that you can get that with just having a, you know, kind of a mailbox address and have a business tax receipt without having any staff here. But if you're, if you're doing business in that county, you're required to have one anyway. That's my point. Yeah, I think her point is that she said the headquarters needs to be here. And that would be great, I think. It's where your license is held, where your license is on the wall, perhaps. I, didn't, I wasn't going that far. You could have a headquarters in Miami Days as long as you have a substantial office here. Or you've got you've got 100 people in uh, Miami Dade, and if you got 50 people here, and you're going to run your job out of here in Palm Beach County, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to support this at all. Uh, I just don't think it's the right direction. Um, I don't think the points are enough. Uh, my point would be to do Palm Beach County, or we don't. I like Michael Gelfand's idea of finding out what the other two counties already have set up. Um, workload of the proposer i mean you're asking for a workload with other school districts i'd want to see the contractor's total workload maybe this is the first school that they've taken on but yet they've got you know 50 other 50 story condos they're working on and they're overextended so um what are we expected to do with this is this just information for us are we supposed to take a well, uh, a position this and is recommendation not a, to the board this is not a, a recommendation for the board this does not go to the board this is a staff um, establishment of criteria for selection committees. Hmm. Out of a courtesy, I brought it to you okay. so that you all would see that we are in fact complying. We're complying with the CCNA. If you so choose to disagree, we'll ask Mr. Doctor to um, voice your disapproval um, in your meeting minutes, but that doesn't change. Yeah, this is fine. not a board item. It's not going to the board. It is strictly going to purchasing department for them to implement on the next round of RFPs in an effort to comply with CCNA. So Les, we're going to see any courtesies. I'm sorry? It's a joke. I said last time we're going to see any courtesies. No, no. In, in all seriousness, I may seem like it I'm joke, again. David. It was a joke. I don't know. <laughs> but I want you guys to understand, I do appreciate the feedback. I'm just trying to let you know where this is coming from. This is not, we don't, the court board does not drive policy, right? We don't dictate policy. And in this particular case, 
the items that I'm putting forth are there in the scoring numbers with an intent to keep it minimized. Yes, I'm saying it, to keep it minimized because, but we need to comply with CCNA. We have to have these criteria in our future RFPs. Does that come down from legal? Um, when we received the comments from Mr. Cheshire, um, you know, we reviewed it, and and I think that the what you're seeing there is um, the result of many meetings with purchasing and facilities to better align our selection criteria with CCNA. Um, the different elements that are addressed there um, had not been specifically addressed in the scoring criteria, and CCNA says that you shall consider, and then they give you the laundry list of things. What we're talking about here um, with the points and how we're defining those things, under CCNA, that's left up to the individual government entity. So CCNA doesn't tell you you have to do this and define it this way. Um, so, you know, based on the discussion, my recommendation, you know, is that I think that purchasing facilities and legal we all get together and, and discuss some of the feedback that we've received here today, because I think it is very valuable. And then perhaps we could address some of those questions. But what you're seeing is the result of numerous meetings between legal facilities and purchasing to come up with scoring criteria that would align directly with CCNA and that would also address the practical needs of facilities moving forward. He's John. Yeah, if this is going to be rammed down our throats and you're not going to take our, well, no, that's what you just said, basically, in my words, but if you're not going to take our thoughts into nope. your policy, then I'm not sure why you brought it. But uh, number three, the volume of work uh, previously awarded five points, again, is not enough. We, we talked about earlier, you want to spread the work around. You want uh, you don't want the same contractor getting the work time after time, and you need more points than five points. Um, you know, I don't know what 20, 25, whatever it may be, but five points isn't going to move the needle at all. We used well, to again, we used to have a gradated uh, value in some of the selection committees for previous work. There I, is, I think. If you scroll down, Jim, I think it's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right there. And five isn't enough. I, I understand. I, the intent was not to introduce these to make a dramatic swing to it. If if it's if it's a hundred points, and we're adding ten points to it by these three criteria, I mean that's a 10 ten percent increase. It's not a hundred. It's hundred and sixty-five points. As I said, if I have to adjust these a couple of points up because based on 100 versus um, 160 or 120 if it's on the design side, um, we'll make those adjustments. We will. It won't, maybe it won't be two and three and five or you know, that those, the upper, upper limit of those points. We'll, we'll consider whether we need to up them a little bit more, but we're not going to make them 40% more of uh, uh, the selection process. Frank. First of all, I was on a committee where we ended up with a tie. So one point would have made a difference. So it is of some factor. However, the problem I've had lately is when a lot of this was established way back, we did joint meetings with staff and, and some cork members before it got to cork. These days, it's all done by staff, and then we see it afterwards. I don't know why people like John or some of the other people here with the background shouldn't be on the initial discussions, which might bring it here in a better form. Yeah, my, my point is that I, I, reading between the lines, this is just being done to comply with CCNA so we don't get Right. Elections thrown out because we haven't complied before, because these points aren't going to matter. Right, the points are so limited, and and the huh. focus is so narrow that it's not making, it's not sending a message to anybody to say, well, oh, this matters. That's not our intent. Well, it's that's not that's, to send that's a message. That's what the points that, are doing. Well, because up until now, 
um, because what you're going to do is you're going to open the door to seven more criteria. Because I guarantee you, one of you will all come up with, with some ideas of, you know what else we got to do? And all of a sudden, what turned out to be 10 points ends up being 50 points with five more criteria that when you, when you look at the totality of the selection, the selection should be based on the performance of the firm and the performance of the subs, the qualifications, the... Like, we've, all, like we've always they had really before this. Be. And, and it does. Right. That's why this is such a minimally minimized amount. It's not meant to sway it dramatically. If you turn 100 points into 140 or 160 into 200, that's going to be a, a dramatic swing in this. And that's not the intent of these. As I said, that's clear. Yeah. That it's just up here for, I'll say, smoke and mirrors to comply with CCNA and not really intended to really do anything that these criteria say. Leah? Yes, I, I, I think I agree with the attorney that we send this back to staff. We don't really say yay or nay at this point. Let them work it out, review, see how it's aligned with any other embedded policy considerations that the staff would know the board would want to see. Uh, particularly, for example, uh, on the local preference and the inclusion uh, policies. So, you know, and I would also recommend that you maybe include Attorney Franklin Lee uh, on this as well, because all of these things do feed into and link into all of these other embedded policies. So <clears throat> I understand you're trying to just comply with CCNA, but there are some other considerations as well that should be included, and I would agree with legal to send it back, um, you know, review it with staff, run it by legal and run it by Mr. Lee as well. And then you know, for further John. consideration at a later time. So what David was just saying about when we do a selection, the most important things are the firm involved and the project team members that they're going to put on the project. And I agree with that 100%. In my experience, those are the two most important things. When we do a CM selection and there's a uh, short list and a final, the, t the firm and the team members are not considered in the final selection, in this phase two. What's considered is when you evaluate the firm, the GMP, whatever that means, cost control, schedule reporting, quality assurance, and approach to construction program requirements. And the selection committee is not allowed to consider the team members. And I think that's a mistake. I think that's to be included in the final selection of phase two of the project. It is in phase one, I give you that. And those three firms that are there, they've already been judged on that. But then I wanna judge them against each other in the final selection. So that's my recommendation on that. I'm, I'm Tom Berger. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I have to go to a hearing in three minutes. Can I be excused? Or do, yes. or do we lose quorum at that point? No, we're okay. We have quorum. Guys, have a good week. I will talk to, or months. See you soon. Okay. Bye. Leah, Leah, you raised your hand again? No, I'm sorry. I always forget to turn it off. Okay. All right. Hey, Mark Thank Moon, you. Mark, did you have your hand up at one point? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I did, and I, I don't know whether this is significant or not. I think it might be, but in CCNA, and I'll just read, you know, after they list the litany of things that that the are supposed to be considered in the selection process, um, it ends with the following provided such distribution does not violate the principle of selection of the most highly qualified firms. So what that says to me is all of the things that you consider, which includes location, prior contract award, the things you're currently discussing, the things that anything else you want to throw in there as additional criteria, the main purpose is to select the most qualified firm. And that's what the statute says. So these points that you're considering and to, to Dave's point, if you start increasing point awards to the extent that location and prior contract award and those things override 
the selection committee's ability to select the most qualified firm based on those two categories of experience of the firm and the project members, then you're flying in the face of statutes. Yeah, so we just need to be under 50% for these uh, three criteria we're talking about. Not a problem. I, I, I don't you. think I don't think it's as simple as that, John. I think that you know you can demonstrate by point of word where if you made these categories worth 30 points or 25 points, that if the scoring on the other categories, the other two criteria that are qualifications based is close enough, you could show where these points could affect or override the points awarded by the selection committee on those other two categories. Uh, don't really know that we can debate that right now or should, just making the point. Okay, well, there's nothing for us to vote on here. I think that we voiced our opinions. And, um, and I'm certainly going to consider bringing it back. We're gonna continue to work on this. I'll look at, especially look at the numbers and the percentages um, to see if they're, if there's, if it's worthy of increasing them. Um, does anybody have any feedback on John's other suggestion? Because I know that's John. John had some really good suggestions. One of the ones that I disagreed with at the time is um, rescoring the team members in the final selection. We don't have many final selections, but when we do, does anybody else have any feedback on that? I think there should question. be something in there, not not rescoring the firm, because the firm, all three firms got there. So all three firms are very capable of doing the, staff. the job. Sorry, the staff. I know. Oh, okay. John had mentioned firm and staff. Oh, okay. But I think there should be some points in there to grade one firm's staff over another firm's staff. Because even though they're all three in the top echelon, yeah. there's going to be some minor difference where one superintendent's got 50 years of experience and the other one's got exactly. 10 years of experience all in Connecticut. Even though it was a really good superintendent, he's a fish out of water compared to the 50-year guy for South Florida. Mm -hmm. So to me, there should be a, a difference there, just a minute, Frank, um, that should get carried through. Okay. So I agree with that. Frank. Oh, phase two is where you actually can question the proposed project manager, the proposed superintendent. You don't question them in phase one. Yeah. So that's when you get a better chance yep. to maybe make sure that they're as good as they were, we were told they are. I, t I told David this, I used an example. Uh, uh, final selection, the superintendent shows up drunk. Well, you don't want that firm anymore, right? <laughs> Depends. I was, wasn't on that one with you. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I, you all are talking about the these CM selection. I, I participate more in the design side. And on the phase two, I don't know if it's, like you say, they all got here for a reason. And typically at that point, they've looked at the project and they've come in with their approach to it. And that's what, you know, I sort of gr grab onto, not all this other criteria, but, you know, is it a good approach? Did, did they do their work? Or, you know, how serious are they? And I, I agree with that on the design end because so, yeah. unfortunately, most of them come in with these whiz bang video fly around movies of a building already designed that may never end up looking like that and they wow everybody and they win the job over well but if they come in and said this site has this issues you know this kind of neighbors etc cetera, etc cetera, you know i listen i do too that, that's what i i grade heavily on the approach to the project huh. right at that point you know what they've done yep okay well i, I appreciate that i, I you, you you can bring this back i, I mean from my point of view, I think you just do what you want and implement it because, yeah. to me, this is so far off what I would have grafted. I would have said, just Palm Beach County. If we're going to do something, then it should just be Palm Beach County. I know two architectural firms that have declined to even apply for Palm Beach County school jobs anymore because everything is so heavily weighted against them in terms of diversity and everything else. And so you're getting Broward and Miami firms 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we're talking selection. I don't know if I brought this up before, but what's happening is the minority partners that they're bringing in in their so in their, their presentations are a very important part of what they're presenting. 
They have pictures of them. They have them for the jobs that they're going to do within the, if they win. And what's happening is the same firm is being presented by different construction managers. And I don't think, that I, I have questions about that. Because normally, when you have a bid process, nobody's allowed to make two bids. You make one bid. And if they're that important part of it, they should be tied to the CM that's submitting them. And I don't know if it's quite right for them to be tied to a number of CMs in the same project. I don't know if you can restrict that. I don't think you can exclude. You, you, what you're saying is you want to tell the SBE Subconsultant, you only can go with the one CM. That well, it's not a consultant. It's not what? It's another another story. That when the architect has a mechanical or electrical, that's a different. <coughs> I'm talking about the construction manager, right? And they're coming in with the same minority, major, and in fact, they're submitting as if they want to get SBE credits. Sure from that firm. But you're saying they only can tie to one CM. That's, that's my feeling is that only one minority part, a minority submitter should only be able to tie to one CM. And the problem with that is if you've got 10 CMs making a submission and I'm an SBE, I only go with you and then you don't get selected and now I'm shut out. I, I don't think the Office of Diversity would support that. I'm sure they wouldn't, you can't limit an SBE on how many, who we can do business with. What if an SBE came in with five firms? Sure. I, I don't even think I don't even think the FTC would allow that. That's unfair trade. You can't restrict somebody from doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Vicki Sykes. Absolutely. You you number one. You can't tell the prime. Oh, you can only partner with this company, and you can't tell the SBE you can only partner with this particular prime. Yeah. Uh, that's an unfair labor practice. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, that, that's understood. I don't understand why someone would have an issue with that either. I don't understand how it's a labor practice. They're part of a bidding package. Well, that's if you were maybe if you're thinking like at a hard bid, like a price. But when there's when we're going through the RFP selection process, you're you're bid, bidding based on qualifications, not actual dollar values. No. Frank, I think it's up to you sitting on the committee if you've got the same SBE for four firms that you have to evaluate how that SBE works with that firm. Maybe they've never worked with that firm before. And to me, that would be a downgrade versus that SBE having worked with that CM on 10 previous projects. Well, to me, I'm going to grade that as a higher point level because the learning curve is already out of the way. So I, I think that's unfortunately an issue. What I've seen in the presentation was not very clear to me how much they worked together. Maybe that's, that's up to you to bring that question yeah, up. That they, oh, I, out. I bring that question up yeah, all the time. The that's a major I'm question sorry. I've got for everyone. Again, thank you everybody for the feedback uh, on this. Um, and sincerely, I know it doesn't seem like it, but sincerely, I do appreciate it. And John, again, we may disagree on things, but I do appreciate the fact that you called this out and brought it to our attention. And we are doing right by it. We're, we're gonna make sure that we, we address it. Uh, again, you can bring it back if you want. I mean, it's just going to be for informational purposes because it's just going to be something you do. Uh, I really feel that the board needs to know about this also instead of the newspapers getting a hold of it and saying, Palm Beach County Schools now has a local preference points award. The board won't be real happy to know that that's in there if they didn't ask for a local preference it's, document. Yeah, it's, and that's the thing. It's not really... I, it's going to be perceived uh, yeah. that way. Yes, so, understood. Understood. Uh, uh, anyway. I don't control what you send to the board. <laughs> Up to you guys what you want to do. All right. Um, approval of minutes. Anyone with issues on the minutes? Virginia. Uh, the minutes indicate that there was no um, board member present, but Frank Barbieri was with us for some period of time. I think he was connected virtually, though, wasn't he? Yes. No, he was in the room. Okay, I forgot about that. You can modify that. Nope. Okay, we'll change that. Michael? Yes, if the bidets can reflect instead of approving that the that court has no objection to the board considering on the motions. I think we added that language. Miss one or two, we'll, we'll check it. 
on some of them, but not all. Okay. 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 And, and that should be our standard language going forward. Sure. Because we have no approval authority. Fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else on minutes by anybody? Okay. Then the minutes are accepted as amended. <laughs> Anything for our next meeting that we want to have staff bring back to us, Jim? Yes, please. Um, I have standing orders from you guys every October to put an agenda item on for you to decide whether or not you would allow your chairman to, to run again, even though he's had a consecutive term. So I'm going to put that on the agenda unless you guys object. Thank okay. you. Thank you for catching that. No problem. And the uh, last thing I need to say is... Uh, for the folks in the audience, if you haven't signed in, can can you please make sure I get? I want you to get credit for being here. So, <laughs> right, thank you. There's Everyone, no extra, no extra credit. You just yeah. get credit. We need to put you on the meeting minutes. So, all right. Uh, anything by anybody else, Virginia? Yes, I just want to say how much is, uh, improved this system is. This has been uh, very, very good to attend virtually with the new setup that you've you've done. And I do like when you zoom in, and I do uh, appreciate being able to see everyone. Uh, so I congratulate your IT department for the excellent job, and 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 also Jim for his video uh, <laughs> expertise. And Dave for making it happen. Yeah. Well done, well done. Sam, I might know that uh, coming back to this room, I I was nervous. Today, I. I feel comfortable. Good. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's we just did, don't have a lot of the staff here. I had a lot of staff stay yeah. upstairs. Absolutely. And, uh, virtual, so. Appreciate that. Well, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I like the system also. I just have one recommendation is it's still a little difficult to hear. Um, I don't know how the volume could be adjusted, but it's only so I can only turn it up so so far and it's still difficult to hear. Leah, it might be on your end because we, Jim had to crank up the volume high for us to hear you also. Okay. Yeah, Leah, I can barely hear you over here. It's I agree. Strange. I hear everybody, but, but Leah, we have to really strain to hear you. Okay, maybe it's my device. Next time I'll, I'll be on the laptop. I'll try yeah, that. Try that, try that and then we'll see that's a difference because uh, with Michael and Virginia, they're loud and clear like they're in the room. Are they aware of the closed captions, which are terrific? I don't know, but there's big difference captioning, too, if you have a hard time hearing things. Supposedly. No, no the only person I had trouble hearing was late. I had to adjust the volume manually. Yeah. But we'll try it on your laptop next month, Leah, and see if that helps. Okay. All right. Anything by anybody else? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Take Thank care. You. Have a good week. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Now. You can uh, turn the mic.